Maurice Young is a, he's a highly educated man. Uh, he could choose, I can't even imagine how many different roads he could choose to take in his life. And he's chosen to be an advocate for those without homes. No one that I know of is willing to give up their posh job downtown and their nice you know, home with their nice car to go down there and experience what the homeless people are experiencing. If you didn't know Marty and you looked at him walking down the street and you see his beard and you see his dreads and you see what he have on, you're like, oh, what's up with that dude? When we were in high school, we had a group, a dance group called EGD, Every Girl Stream, that we would win all the time. I mean, we were just that good. He was always a pretty boy. He had to get his hair just right. He had to have the right cologne on. Everything had to match. People would flock to him, but the people that he let stay around him were the weaker kids that got picked on. But my brother has two degrees. He was the president valedictorian of his class when he graduated. He decided to, to take himself down to the lowest level because he didn't trust himself not to get back into that old Maurice. What does that look like uh, to love thy neighbor as you would love thyself? Self. Didn't know what that looked like. I felt like when I had what I had, it was hindering me from giving 100%. But if I have nothing to give, ironically, I have everything to give. Irish Hill was clearly uh, the largest community of homeless people in Indianapolis. My home is where your heart is at. My heart was in my tent, in my, in my camp community. It was a place you could come, find refuge, safety and peace, until you could start making better choices, if that was what your goal was. The police officers that came through that beat noticed a, a marked difference between the number of calls that they received when he wasn't there to the number of calls he received, they almost went to zero. And he said, well, I have an intake process. Um, I've got a bed that's right next to my tent, and I take the people in and I just monitor them. I see what their needs are. There's usually a reason why they're here. The camp really helped meet the needs of the homeless within our community. The basic needs, the water, the safety, the security, and the relationship. And then at that point, people were then ready to make different choices and transition themselves out of homelessness. Various service providers felt it was so cool to find their clients in one location. And we had transitioned out about 61 people since June of last year because of the way that the camp was structured and organized. There is a peace over him that I hadn't seen in a long time. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's not down there struggling. He's actually down there making people better and making it better for people. They have a block party for all the rest of the uh, folks who are homeless that live around the city. What homeless group has block parties every Sunday? They were certainly grateful to be part of a group. It's very vulnerable being out on your own. It's a mini city of sorts, a homeless camp that sits under a CSX viaduct on Davidson Avenue, southeast of downtown. And if this is a community, Maurice is its mayor. He's been living in his tent here for two years. But the city has told Maurice and the 66 others they have to leave by Monday. Signs posted say it's for construction and bridge cleaning. Maurice believes the land across from the tent city has been sold for development. This probably doesn't help uh, land values too much here. It's basically what it boiled down to. So they had to come up with a reason to move them. But it took them two years to come up with a reason. I think, again, it's an attempt to move the homeless out of downtown. And I told them we are peacefully protesting 
the seizure and the destruction of our personal property without our due process rights. This turned out to be a pretty peaceful eviction. Yeah, Lauren, it really did. It was pretty peaceful, but it was also a little heartbreaking. Now, 67 people actually called this area home not too long ago. They were given an eviction notice one week ago, and today was that deadline that they had to get out. The man who other homeless people here at the camp referred to as their leader, Maurice Young, was arrested after refusing to leave. He and four other people who were not homeless but said they were here to support him were arrested for obstructing traffic, a Class B misdemeanor. He stood in grace. He was loving, peaceful, calm, accepting. He was like, if I don't get locked up, nobody will ever hear my story. But if I do get locked up, everybody will want to hear my story. I felt like the only way we could make a stand was to get this thing into a courtroom. Unlike in the past, the city has done these type of uh, evictions and it went under the cover of darkness, but not this one. So I was really excited about that because the homeless people have rights and they know that we have rights and the things that they were doing were illegal. We want to put a proposal settlement together and present it to the city, to the mayor himself, requesting a day shelter for homeless for the wintertime, a safe place for people to sleep during the nighttime and uh, the homeless bill of rights. It gives homeless people leverage to sue people who discriminate against them. But as long as the end result is a better environment for the homeless in the city of Indianapolis, I think we'll be happy. I don't know how you can become a, a non-homeless friendly city but um, this whole war, it's like they've declared war on the homeless. Indianapolis prefers things spread out because if everything is spread out, if you have three or four here, two or three there, a few over there, that doesn't seem to be a problem. But if we all come together, then unfortunately you see that there is a problem which becomes a problem. But all that we seek is a place for the homeless to be. So let's address it and make it a win-win for everybody. But who wants to talk about a problem that they don't think they have? So I get it. During our process, we have had a lot of people come down to offer us assistance. But when the pastor and them came down and offered a building, I was deeply moved by that because if I understood correctly, the building was going to be a school that they were going to use to support them in their ministry. Estando en aquel lugar en Michigan, miramos las noticias que allí estaba arrestando a Maurice y a todas las personas del mismo lugar. Y entonces yo en mi corazón y con mi esposa dije, andamos buscando ropa para ellos y los están sacando. Nosotros venimos inmediatamente para acá, Indianapolis. Empezamos a buscarlo en las, todas las los cárceles, buscarlo por las calles y muchos lugares más, y no lo encontrábamos. And after they had heard what had happened, they were willing to forego their needs and then give the building to us. Estas aulas las quería para clases, pero cuando Dios te cambia tu corazón, no puedes hacer las cosas que tú quieres, sino las que Dios quiere. A lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and so what happens when that paycheck goes away? I don't think we're that far away from being homeless ourselves. These are human beings. These are individuals who have individual challenges. Other people, they're just, they're the same as us, but they, they don't have the things we have. It's as if they have no name no face, it's as if they're being, they're, they're invisible. He really, truly cares about those people there. Then I'm like, well, should Maurice be working for a living because he's more than capable? Should he be living off of the systems that I pay taxes into? I don't know, and, and where do these people go? They, I believe that they should be cared for, but how? But those people have a story, and most of us don't have the time to go down and spend time with people who are troubled. 
But Maurice is that guy. He's the one down there building relationships and helping these guys. He connects with them heart to heart. Maurice lives with his heart wide open. Maurice has a heart of gold. He's hit a whole bunch of homeless people, and I'm one of those. Of all the causes, I think that this particular group of folks, the homeless people, they have the least amount of advocates, and they, have, they don't have very many effective advocates either, so this was it for me. Yo pienso que él es un hombre especial para Dios. Nadie va a ir a poner la cara por otro y a que lo arresten y todo. Pienso que es un hombre que Dios lo necesita a él para hacer cosas grandes que nadie las quiere hacer. I think the truth found me and drew me to it. And I, I followed it. And that path led me where I am today. Because the garden has to have a gardener. <laughs> As long as there are people that need help and he's in a position to help them, um, he's going to do this. Maurice has chosen to be their friend, their voice, their advocate, and he does that living side by side with them. Thank you. Thank you. Ani almost made me feel nervous. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, first, let me say I want to thank Solid Word because Solid Word has been a, um, a tremendous part of this ministry. Um, so I want to thank uh, Lonnie and Tracy who do lunches for us. We do um, case and crisis management every Wednesday at Central Library. Um, and the foundation of that is signing the homeless community up for health care insurance. And I'm sure a lot of people don't know, but we have the best health care package in the nation here in Indianapolis. So for $12 or a dollar a month, we have medical, dental, and vision. So as an advocate, I knew that the community couldn't afford the dollar because if you don't have it, you don't have it, right? So we knocked on doors and got sponsors, and when people come to get signed up, we pay for it. And that's one thing we can take off the plate for homeless individuals, right? Um, so, and with that came people talking about the other issues that they were having. So now it has evolved into case and crisis management, right? So we help people with the basic needs is where we try to stay focused. Um, so I don't know for those who remember Mr. Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, how he discussed you must meet the people's basic needs before they can move up. And I'm, 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 I'm a believer of that. I see that. I witness that every day. So we try to get people secured in food, shelter, sleep, and the health care, right? So I have counterparts who argue about the employment, but it's funny because when we, when I go to talk, I say, I'll take a magnet of the word employment and I'll put the pyramid up and I'll say, where, tell me where do you think the peer, where the employment should go on the pyramid, right? Because if you put it at the basic needs, I can show you that that won't work. I got people going to work from tents, alleys, and out of cars, and they're never successful because they don't have that foundation they need to be successful, right? But employment is good, but that's the next step after we meet these basic needs. So that's what we do on Wednesday. And Lonnie and uh, um, Tracy, she's going to kill me. I almost forgot that. They bring lunches on the first Wednesday of every month. The choir does the lunches on the third Wednesday of every month. So I want to definitely say thank you to those individuals. Um, and then I wanted to thank the missions and the hospitality. Um, we do Indianapolis' biggest fish fry in the city. Huge. Yeah, so yeah, give yourselves a hand. They come out, Murph and the cooks all come out and cook it fresh. Um, and they have uh, fish, french fries, spaghetti. I mean, they really hook it up. We had over 300 some odd people come out and um, I, I fear next this year it will be even bigger. So um, I want everybody to be prepared for that. 
Um, and then another thing we do is a Subway, Subway sandwiches. Um, I think it's in March this year. So I want to thank Hospitality and Missions for that. We go downtown and we make a, they, Lonnie negotiates with the lady about a price for the sandwiches in bulk. So then I get the information out there and we have a ton of people come. And this is kind of, um, it's kind of a, a steam builder because for the first time, people are not just bringing you food and just giving it to you and say here and then leave. You come to Subway, you get in line, you get the sandwich that you so choose, a 12 inch, and then we give you the chips and the water and the cookie. And then I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it's huge for people to have that kind of freedom. You know, they don't, we don't get that a lot. Everything is just given to us and we just have to take it. So we're trying to challenge, but that I wanted to thank the missions and the hospitality for that. Um, and then we had a, a young lady who found herself trying to keep herself employed while she was pregnant. Um, and she was like eight, seven or eight months, eight months in. And I asked her, why are you? And she was trying to get a job at a factory and she wanted me to write a reference. And I'm like, why, why would you do that? And she said, we don't have anything for this baby when it comes. We don't have wives. We don't have diapers. We don't have anything. I said, well, where are you going to live when the baby comes? And she said, well, my mother said I can come back home. I said, okay, well, you don't have to go compromise you and your, the baby's safety in some warehouse working. We'll just have a baby shower. So I called Lonnie. She started calling people. And next thing that we had a baby shower, she won't have to buy no diapers for a couple of years. So we and wipes. So we good on that. So I want to thank you guys for that. And then Miss Fonda, I don't know if she's here. The hats that she knitted for the folks, I want to thank her for that. Um, and then, of course, I want to thank Solid Word when we did our Christmas Eve breakfast. We didn't do it this year, but they come out and they do the gifts and they help us with the cleanup part of that. And then, last but not least, I want to thank Murph. Um, I don't know I, where's Murph at. I don't know if he just goes out and just starts barbecuing hamburgers and chicken and he'll call me, I got something for you. And it's just a wonderful thing. But Murph really looks out. Just and it, We never expect it, but he just does what he does. And I definitely appreciate him for that. So thanks, Murph. Uh, questions. Um, he wanted to know what does that mean when people transition out of homelessness? Right. So the biggest challenge with homelessness, when people come in, we have systems already set up and you have to fit the format of the system to be successful. So we don't do that. So let me give you a perfect example. If a gentleman became homeless today, the first thing that he would do or be instructed to do, we call 211. So that's your first step. And 211 will send him down to the mission. And I mean, that's he'll they'll tell him about the missions and tell him which one he needs to go to. So he'll go down to the mission. And then in the morning, the mission will give him a case manager and tell him he needs to go over and get um, a, a different type of case manager at the Horizon House. So they'll leave mission, Wheeler Mission, go to the Horizon House and get a case manager. And then that case manager is going to tell him you need to go to FSSA and get your food stamps and get your, you know, and go to the library and get your insurance. And then you take that step. So if you look at that process, nobody started at the beginning to ask this individual, how did you become homeless? That, that's the first question. You have to assess this. But in our system that we have in the city, they just direct people. And you stay in this vicious circle and you cannot get out. So what we do at the library, what, what happened? How did you become homeless? I was working at the meat plant in Plainfield. It closed up. We've been in the hotel. We exhausted all of our money. So that's where we are. Well, in that situation, I just know you need another job, right? Because if, if, if unemployment brought you to homelessness, then we just undo that. So when we, when it can make sense like that, we have partners who, to whom we can call and put him somewhere where he can do the application process, he can go do interviews, get himself back on his feet, and then once he gets a job, we have a different partner who can get him transportation there until he gets to the first check, and then we just move it forward like that. So we have a process in play, and that's how we do it. Yes, thank you. December the 15th, no, December, yeah, the 12th or the 15th, that was my eighth year being on the streets. And for any mental health professionals out there, let me clear this up. I am here to serve the people who are in need. If I chose to be homeless and just do me, I would be in Hawaii or Puerto Rico. I want you to be clear about that. I'm not missing that, right? So I just, yeah, I've seen some people looking. That's where I would be if it was about me, right? But I want to serve these people and they happen to be here in Indianapolis where I'm a native from. So we have a couple options with with that situation, we have a website that's called thecreativechangeproject.com, 
right? And on that first page, there's a toolbox. So if you want to try to help somebody, I have put links on there, depending on what their need is, to where you can kind of help them navigate that process. If you think it's a bit complex, you can then either send them to the library on Wednesday or reach out to me and then we can assess the situation and see what direction we can go from there. Because every other day but Wednesday, I'm at the IUPUI library where homeless people know where to find me all the time. But the website is, the, is your best resource if you're attempting to do that. Creative Change Project, uh, yep, just Google that and it'll come up. Thank you for the question. Okay. You end it. Go ahead. So um, Maurice will be in the lobby for more questions. And I'd like you, I hope it's clear that we're not supporting this ministry for social reasons or political reasons. We have seen this guy minister the hearts and souls of the lost. And as a ministry, it's consistent with what we do as a church. And that's why we've come alongside of him. When you see on the envelope missions, part of what we do is provide support in the ways in which he listed. And I want, before Pastor prays, I want to publicly thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Merv. Thank you, Sister Mattis. Thank you, church, for how you've come alongside with Maurice. And brother, please know that as, as a church, we love you and we love Amen. the ministry. Amen. Why don't you stay right here, Curtis? Lonnie, please come on up. I'm going to ask us to stand, please. Can we stand and get ready to pray? And here's what our prayer is. I thank God for this brother demonstrating what it means to leave the comfort and go to where the need is. Uh, he's actually following the example of our Lord who left the comfort of purity and peace and came down in our mess. And he did something. Of course, he saved us. He died for us. He, he saved us. But then he gave us an example and a model that we would live sacrificially for others. And that's what I appreciate about what I'm hearing in this. And then I would say, understand what my brother was saying about it not being social. And yet the gospel in its expression is social. And we have to understand that it is in the community that the gospel is displayed. And so and then a person can come to see and hear the gospel that's there. And so we want to pray for this brother that God continues to protect him, that God continues to watch over him, gives him wisdom. And that as he continues to engage the homeless, God would continue to bring more and more to the faith and through that bring more and more to wholeness. Amen. And that our hearts would be shaped as we assist this brother in what God has him do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for my brother. Thank you, Lord, for his love for you. Thank you, Lord, for his sacrifice. God, it's, it's, it's amazing that how you take our hearts, you shape it and you change it. And thank you that it's evident in this, brother, that you've done that. Thank you for his work among the homeless or his love for the people that are on the streets. I know sometimes, Lord, if we put that label on it, homeless, it becomes a little less human to us. But, Father, they are people made in your image whom you died for. Father, I pray we never forget that. Father, I just remember my time growing up in New York and seeing the homeless all the time and how you've dealt and worked on my heart through that. Father, may we continually allow you to work on our hearts as we seek to bring your love to this city and to our world. I pray for my brother, Lord, that you would cover and protect. Lord, that you would meet his needs. And Lord, as he sacrifices himself, may others refresh him. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to have wisdom in how we support this brother and to find the best way to do it. Thank you, Falani. Thank you for Tracy. Thank you for Glimmer. Thank you for all of them that have stood and all the others in this fellowship that have supported this ministry and this brother. And I pray we would continue to do it out of wisdom, out of love, God, and out of grace. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard this morning. Let it not fall on deaf ears. Let us do something with it. In Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.